Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to another week of Trauma Recovery University. I am your host, Athena Moberg, and with us, of course, is your incredible co-host, Bobby Parrish. Welcome, welcome. If this is your first time joining us, you're new to our broadcast, I'm Athena Moberg, this is Bobby Parrish, and we show up here every single week and we answer your questions on the topic of childhood sexual abuse or any type of child abuse and different topics uh, having to do with the recovery journey from child abuse. So every single week we show up and we have a different topic and this week's topic is validation. The power of being validated. The power of validation. <laughs> What does it mean to be validated? What is validation? Is there um, a special role that validation plays in our recovery journey? And if we are invalidated, does it hinder our recovery journey? Where do we receive validation? And where are the different way what are the different ways we can validate others? And we're gonna just unpack all of this and we're going to have a very validating conversation, <laughs> I'm sure, on our Twitter feed and over on YouTube in our chat box. If you are watching us on Roku, hello. We love you guys so much. We have the greatest Roku family ever. We really appreciate you guys. And thank you so much for watching us on YouTube as well. If you are listening on a podcast platform such as iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, or even iHeartRadio, we want to thank you so much for being here and being a listener. And we would love for you to subscribe to this podcast, subscribe to this YouTube channel, subscribe to our Roku TV channel, and share with someone you know who may have been a victim of child abuse or is an adult survivor of child abuse. We would love to be a source of support and encouragement to them on their recovery journey. So um, what we do every week, we have our, our community. They show up live on Twitter and they tweet us using the hashtag no more shame and they send us questions on the topic of the week and then we answer those questions and then over on YouTube there is a, a live chat feature as well a live chat box so you can go hang out with everybody over there on YouTube as well and we'll hopefully um, just we'll know we'll have somebody tweet us and let us know if you're asking a question we would love to answer your questions so if you're watching us on a replay we are so happy you're here it might be well today is december 5th 2016 but you could be watching this in 2020 at three in the morning and you can't sleep and you googled childhood sexual abuse or validation or something and if that's you or whenever it is that you're watching this video we want to welcome you and let it and let you know that you're safe here, that this is a safe place. So we have support groups set up online. You can go over to the about section of our channel and find out how to get plugged in. But without further ado, I would love to hand this over to your incredible co-host, Bobby Parrish. And she will um, bring us up to date with some things that are happening in our community, issue a trigger warning, let you know how you can receive immediate support if you happen to be triggered, depending on where you're located in the world. This channel is currently reaching over 170 countries. We're grateful for each and every one of you, and just thank you for being here. We are so honored, and we're glad you're receiving the resources. So if you are watching on a replay, you can, uh, and you would like to just fast forward, and you don't wanna sit through the Q&A portion and, and chat that where everybody's asking questions, you can go down um, in the description section of this video just before you get to the comments, and you can click on the little button that says if you're watching a replay, and you can you can go ahead and fast forward if that's what you would like to do. I would just I say that tentatively only because sometimes when other people ask a question, it is your question that you were going to ask. And you get the answer to that question. And it can really give you an aha moment or a light bulb moment and really push you further in your recovery journey. So um, do so. Um, 
if you if you need to, if time is of the essence. Otherwise, please hang out with us and please show up here every single Monday. You're welcome to join us, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. But uh, I will go ahead and hand this over to Bobby. And I thank you again so much for being here with us. Take it away, Bobby. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to issue, first off, before anything else goes on, a trigger warning. Um, because tonight's broadcast, as all of our broadcasts, deals with childhood abuse and sometimes specifically with childhood sexual abuse. So we want to let you know to take excellent care of yourself while you're watching this video. Um, practice good self-care strategies and set some boundaries so that if you recognize that you're getting upset and you're getting triggered, you go ahead and shut the video down and walk away. Um, it'll either be here if you're here live, it'll get uploaded to YouTube, you can watch it there. Or if you're already watching a replay, you can come back at any time and pick up where you left off. We want this video to be something that encourages you and provides you with the information you need for your trauma recovery, not something that upsets you and triggers you. If you are in crisis now or you need help urgently, we'd ask that you reach out to our friends at RAIN if you're in the US or Canada. RAIN is the Rape Abuse Incest National Network. Their number is 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E. You can also reach them 24 seven, 365 on their crisis chat feature on their website. And that is RAIN.org. So R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. If you're in the UK, you can reach out to the Samaritans and they have a wide variety of ways you can get in contact with them, including being able to drop into a local office. If you want to find out more, you can go to their website at Samaritans.org. If you need help and want to use their hotline, that number is 116-123. You can also text them for help at 07725-909090. And finally, you can email them at joe, J-O, at samaritans.org. If you're in Australia, you can reach your crisis hotline. And that number is 131114. Yes, I finally got them all. <laughs> Yay. Had to double check though, didn't quite trust myself. <laughs> it's only been a year. <laughs> Okay, so tonight we're talking about validation. If you were here last week, you're going to go, hey, wait a minute. I recognize that topic. And yes, because last week while we were talking about accepting the reality of our abuse, we talked about the step of receiving validation. It's one of the first steps in the process of accepting the reality of our abuse. So I encourage you to go back and take a look at that tape if you haven't already. But tonight we're gonna to pull out the piece of validation and look at it um, section by section, step by step, uh, letter by letter, for a couple of reasons. And one, because it is such a critical piece in the recovery process. I think it's so important that each one of us actively seeks sources of validation in our life and in our recovery. And second, I think it's important for all of us to know how to give validation to others. And we didn't talk about that last week. So tonight we're gonna to talk about not only how to get the validation you need, but how to give the validation that other survivors might need. Um, I work with so many survivors and so often they feel like there's not a lot of point in their lives or they're not worth very much or they don't contribute much to the world. And I tell each of them, as I would tell all of you, one of the best things that you can do to change that is to be of service to and support to other survivors. Okay, no one knows what a survivor is going like going through better than another survivor. No one can sit next to them and say, yeah, me too. I get it. I understand like another survivor. And so if you want to see your voice 
really matter. If you want to see yourself have power in another person's life for good, if you want to make a difference, go out amongst the survivor community and listen and validate and encourage and support. Because as much as we all need that, we need to receive that, I honestly believe we also need to give that. Um, because when we give it, then that proves to us that yes, in fact, we're worthy. Um, so let's talk tonight about not only what is validation and why do we need to receive it, but also how do we give it to others. Um, and validation is simply the reassurance or the assurance that something that you believe happened did in fact happen. Okay, so it's kind of like the weird opposite of gaslighting, you know, because gaslighting is trying to convince you that something that really did happen didn't happen. Or as validation is here to say, yep, you're right, that happened, you're remembering it correctly, and everything that you thought that took place, took place. And why is that important for survivors? Because what happened to us was not only so horrific, but it was so baffling. You know, as human beings, we search for meaning. Every, uh, everywhere we go, we meaning, meaning, what does this mean? Why did this happen? What does this mean? And it's really hard to wrap your head around someone like a primary caregiver, not only treating you so horribly, but betraying you so horribly. And so we question, and I think it's more the norm than not for survivors to question their memories and their thoughts of their childhood abuse. Because chances are, like 94% of all children are abused by someone they know, chances are the person who abused you you were entrusted into their safety and you thought they were safe, but they betrayed you. And because that's so hard for us to understand, it's hard for us to validate that for ourselves. And then unfortunately for us, much of our abuse probably didn't have a witness because our abuser took advantage of the circumstances and manipulated them so that there was no witness. And any enablers, were silenced and probably more often than not our family just does not want to talk about it because that would be messy and let's not heaven forbid talk about anything messy so no. most of us yes heaven forbid right don't, don't yeah let's, let's the apple from, cart. right make waves rock the boat <laughs> I'm, I'm just exactly <laughs> what are those called Athena what are those? Please, no, they're not cliche. Idioms? Is that it? Idioms. Idioms? Yeah. yeah. I'm just a little idiom dictionary tonight. Um, I have a we... question already. Whenever okay, you're ready, great, I have a question. Great. Look. I'm ready. I've, I've given you, all the I, idioms I can remember. I think I completely interrupted your idioms and your thought, though. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that's why, because we don't have witnesses and our family won't talk about it. That's one of the reasons why we really need validation. So it's hard to understand, and there aren't a lot of people who are going to validate it for us. So those are the two reasons why sometimes we need to get our own validation. Question. Question time. Yes. I, uh, the question is from Amanda, and I'm just, I was actually just um, tweeting her for her to let us know if our answers help her. Okay. Um, so... Amanda says, what should we be expecting for, as far as validation goes, from our mental health professionals while we're in session, et cetera? So I absolutely love this question. I would love to answer it and then hand it over to you, Bobby, if that's okay. Sounds great. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So Amanda, great question. Now, first of all, I'm so proud that you even are already like this question comes presupposing that you will in fact and should in fact receive validation from helping professionals <laughs> novel idea everyone not everyone receives that not everyone and and not and, and not all helping professionals are created equal 
So I think we already know this. Um, Bobby and I, we're both practitioners. We both work with survivors for a living. And we are also on both sides of the desk. We are mental health consumers as well as mental health practitioners. So know oh, that, again, going along the lines of not all mental health professionals are created equal, helping professionals sometimes, especially the one, now this is not knocking therapists. Hello, Bobby's a master's level therapist and she's one of my favorite humans on the planet. So this is not bashing therapists. But what I am saying is there are a lot of therapists and helping professionals that follow a medical model, which means you are check, 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 broken, and you need check, check this drug to fix you. Bye-bye. Pat you on the bottom, stick a little Band-Aid on you and, and send you out the door. And there's no power or validation or anything in that. It's basically, or they, or they sort of, um, I would love for you, Bobby, to, when you respond, I would love for you to share the story about how you were called a malingerer because that just, just like gets me so upset. Um, not that I want everybody to get upset, but it's just such a perfect example and illustration of not all helping professionals being created equally. So Jen, with a helping professional, it is, first of all, before you're even in session with that helping professional, before, I would look for someone who is trauma informed. When you are interviewing, a person or looking for a person who will be your therapist or your counselor I would ask them if they are trauma informed or if they are if they are aware of trauma informed practices or if they have studied or attended any continuing education classes on being trauma informed because if you're trauma informed you it's all about empowering the client and letting the client know that they are not broken in need of fixing, they are hurt in need of healing. And or to be a part of their support team and you want to be on the same team with them and get all the help you can so that you can feel better and move on with your life and live an amazing life that you love. And that is pretty much everyone's goal. I would not, I would not guess that it is a lot of people's goal to walk in to receive care from a helping professional and just want to stay broken forever and want to stay hurt and want to stay miserable and want to stay, you know, that's not what we want. Like we are struggling because of something that happened that we didn't have control over uh, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, depending on how old we are when we're, when we're getting help. So, and if we're recovering from childhood sexual abuse. So the, the mistake that some helping professionals make is that they don't equate something happening now in your 40s or 50s that, oh, it's connected to your childhood. Oh, and typically those are helping professionals that, that are following a medical model and they're only looking at the symptoms. They're not looking at the root cause. So what you should expect from a helping professional going going into into session i would expect compassion i would expect them being fully present and giving you eye contact and not being um distracted on their cell phone oh i'm uh, you know and not giving you their full attention i would expect them to be on time for your appointment and i'm i'm not talking like one minute two minutes late like that's human okay but if your helping professional consistently shows up 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes late to your appointments, that's very invalidating and triggering to some people. So I would, I would definitely expect and hope for someone who's prompt, someone who's fully present, someone who's compassionate, someone who's non-judgmental, and someone who assumes the best of you knowing that you are doing the very best you can in your recovery journey and someone who asks questions in uh, not only a tone of voice but with the anticipation of receiving a response from you and, and wanting to help you you can sense you can sense that they want to help you you deserve compassionate validating support from a helping professional that is trauma informed you deserve this you deserve to have your feelings validated your fears um, 
able to be expressed. You deserve to feel safe with your helping professional and not like they are going to, um, you know, go in and be talking about your business with other colleagues unless, of course, you're going to be harming yourself or harming another person. But confidentiality should ever be broken. So that's my take on what you can expect from a helping professional. And of course, it's going to vary if you're dealing with someone who is a therapist versus if you're dealing with someone who's a coach. Now, coaching is a little bit more in your face and challenging you and they ask you questions and they sort of um, the fast pace. It's a little bit more high. You've been through therapy for at least a year and now you're you have a coaching relationship with this person who's a coach and you want to move forward, you're, you're no longer immobilized. You're no longer completely stuck and unable to function. You just wanna move along with your life and heal at a little bit of a faster rate. So um, that's my take on what you can expect in session from a helping professional. Um, always compassionate, always understanding, always non-judgmental, always coming from a place of you are the priority. They work for you, by the way. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody right now. These people work for you. You pay their bills. You feed their cat. You pay their car payment. Okay? They work for you. You are allowed to request someone new. You are allowed to expect a certain amount of compassion and care and to feel safe. And if not, fire them and move on. Yes, I said fire them. I'm talking to somebody who is afraid to use their voice right now. You deserve compassionate, safe care, and they work for you. You don't work for them. You don't have to please them, and you do not have to worry about letting them down or disappointing them. That is not something you should ever, you should never need to manage the emotions of your helping professional. Okay, I'm going to step on down now. I'm going to hand this over to Bobby. <laughs> And I want you, I want your take on what everyone can um, expect from from you or from any from me from any helping professional that they go to see. Well, you know, you and I are share very similar philosophies. I think, as a helping professional, one of my primary roles is to provide you with the things that you need in your recovery. Okay, so just real quick, I want to say that there are some schools of thought, some schools of belief, some schools of therapy out there that the belief that believe that the role of the therapist is not to interdict their own opinions and thoughts. It's to help the client come to their realizations that they need to and to help them to provide themselves with the support that they need. I don't find that incredibly helpful for trauma survivors because we didn't have a childhood that gave us those basic skills. So we are learning them from day one most of the time, the first time we step into therapy. So my opinion for a trauma therapist is should you be able to expect a lot of validation from your therapist, from your helping professional? Yes. Big yes. Lots of it and especially in the beginning. And if you need more, you ask for more, okay? If you're saying, if you come in and you sit down in front of me and say, you know what, I'm still just having a hard time believing that what happened to me is, is true. I don't have a problem. Let's go back over it again. Let's talk about it. It takes a while. You know, Athena's really good at using that phrase one and done. Validation is not a one and done process. You know, someone doesn't validate us once and we're like, oh, okay, good, phew, I'm done. Don't need that anymore. It doesn't have that way. Um, and I think, but I think what's so important and it touches on what Athena said is that a helping professional should never come into an appointment with you already having an opinion about you or what you're going to say. That's the part where I've seen it fall apart more often than not. Um, you know, when Athena was talking about me being told that I was a malingerer because I didn't get better at the rate that my therapist and my psychiatrist thought I should when I first started treatment way back when I was in my late 20s. And I struggled so hard for so long that um, they got frustrated. 
because I wasn't getting better on their schedule. And so they determined that I must be malingering um, because they weren't seeing the results that they wanted. But this was back before so much information about trauma was understood. I got no education about trauma and how it affected me. Um, I wasn't given skills and coping tools for trying to get over my trauma and my abuse and make sense of it. So yeah, it took me a long time. It took me a darn long time and multiple hospital stays and you know, suicide attempt and all these things to finally get my feet on the ground. But the reason they labeled me as malingering was not because I was doing anything wrong. It was because I wasn't meeting their timeline. They came into their work with me with an opinion already fixed in their head. You know, this is how long it should take her to, you know, what, 6.5 sessions every 3.5 months, you know, back before um, there was a law of parity between medical and mental health. And you could only get like six sessions a year of therapy on your insurance. Um, or, you know, another, another side of that coin is that, you know, if you have a professional who thinks you should be feeling worse than you do, or you should need more medication than you do, or you should take more medication, or you should come to therapy more often, um, your helping professional is there to tailor their care to you, not for you to tailor your recovery to their care. Okay, so if you have a therapist who's not providing you the validation that you need, ask for it. Um, while Athena was answering, Joey asked the question, how do I get the validation that I need? I feel like I'm overwhelming people because I need more. And there's nothing wrong with just coming out and saying, I need more validation. And if someone you know, agrees to give it, then they've, you know, they've stepped up to the plate and they've said, yeah, I'll meet you there. I'll do that for you. Whereas if we just go out and seek validation and we sometimes don't name what it is that we want, first of all, we're rarely going to get what we need. But sometimes that's safe because as survivors, we're not good at asking for what we need and heaven forbid what we want, right? How dare we have a want, let alone a need, because chances were high when we were a child, we got slapped down for having any needs or our parents' needs were so superimposed over the top of us that we didn't begin to even have a concept of who we were and what we might need as an individual. So ask for what you need and ask someone, can I ask you for some validation for my experience. I'm really struggling to feel like this part of my recovery took, you know, really happened. Can I ask you about it? And when they say yes, that, you know, they're giving that consent to step up and help you. And, and that's the place where you can then drop that worry that you're overwhelming them. And Athena mentioned that when she was talking about working with a the therapist. Yeah. You should never worry about how your words, your feelings, your work affects the helping professional. This, that's just not a worry that you need to have. And by the same token, when you ask for what you need and someone says, yes, I can do it, then for many of us, that relieves us of feeling any responsibility for taking care of them because we asked for something. So I'm a big advocate of the, the client as the customer modality that Athena said, you know, you're paying the bills. You're this, this person you've hired to provide a service for you. So do your best to get what you need and speak up for what you need because you're worth it. So if that doesn't work, not everybody has options. You know, some of you out there live in itty bitty tiny towns that, you know, have maybe one therapist for everybody. Some of you have an insurance plan that won't let you pick your own therapist. that just assigns one to you. 
um, I recognize not everybody has choices and options. But if you do have choices and options and the therapist that you get doesn't work, don't hesitate to go find another one. Um, because working with a therapist who's not helpful for you, um, at best, probably doesn't help you get much farther ahead in your recovery, and at worst, hinders your recovery. So, and that's not anything that we want for you. Any other questions, Athena? I have some, um, some comments and a couple questions. I want to go back. I'll, I'll go through them really quick. How does that sound? Yes, absolutely. So you already answered um, the one from Joey, which was fantastic. How do I get the validation from someone without going overboard? I feel like I'm too overwhelming sometimes. And, you know, again, like we, I love everything you said. And it's never our job to the emotions of the helping professional. And I want to even go a little bit further, Bobby, and say that when our clients try to manage our emotions, it start if if we're not careful, if we're not really careful, it starts a cycle. The client feeling responsible for the helping professional and the helping professional feeling responsible for the client. And it goes back and forth, back and forth, back. There needs to be this clear, it needs to be communicated by the helping professional. Like, you don't ever have to worry if I'm feeling this way. You are, you're the priority. This is about you, et cetera. Like, I really feel like the, the helping professional needs to let the client know you, that it's a safe place and they don't need to be taken care of or saved or right. rescued. Right. Because we will do that. If the door is open, even a yeah. tiny bit. Oh, yeah. You know, as survivors. <laughs> exactly. We'll rush we'll, right we'll, in. We'll rush right in and we will save the day like Mighty Mouse. And and we don't even, and, and then it, all of a sudden there's this interesting dynamic that happens that needs to stop before it gets started. So um, definitely don't feel the need if possible. Like they work for you. It is so hard for us as survivors to approach anything as though we're in control or we're we're the ones. Like, yeah, like I'm owning this thing. I'm walking in. I'm paying for this service, and the service is going to be provided, and I'm going to walk out, and everything is going to go great. Like sometimes as survivors, that is a long shot. That isn't how things went. And so it's important to try to go into – a therapeutic relationship knowing I have these expectations it's really helpful to write out what it is you're looking for from a helping professional if you are the type of person that needs verbal validation or written validation like if you have correspondence with a helping professional it is important for you to communicate your needs as clearly and succinctly as possible being very clear what it is that you need like I remember telling Bobby years ago I think I need you I think I need you to give me permission to feel this way. Like just we have a working we had a working relationship, working together as as partners. And for some reason, I was in a place where I needed permission to feel a certain way. And she and she would say, "I absolutely give you permission to feel that way. I would feel that way if I were you." And I was like, "Oh, thank you. I feel that way." <laughs> and sometimes we just we, sometimes we need that. And sadly, some helping professionals that are in a position of power abuse that power. And that is not something you can ever predict, and nor is it ever your fault. If a helping professional is in a place where they are in an abusive power situation and they are um, exploiting or taking advantage of someone that is in a weaker position, that is a character flaw of theirs. Sometimes we, as the mental health consumer, needing help from a, from a helping professional, needing validation from a mental health professional, and going into a situation and not receiving that validation, we automatically equate it to, well, if I can't even receive validation from a helping professional that is supposed to be a, a, a pro at this, as a pro, they're the pro, they're the, they're the expert at this, then maybe what I went through wasn't that bad. Maybe 
I've been making it all up. Maybe my feelings are not valid. Maybe I'm the problem all along, like I've been told since I was a child. Right. And Maybe it's God, me. Yes. It's so easy for us to automatically default to that if we don't receive the validation we need from a helping professional. That's why it's so important to clearly and succinctly communicate that need, that you need to be validated. Sometimes a helping professional or human, you know, maybe they're on autopilot. Maybe they don't, maybe they're not in tune with the fact that you need to feel validated. Like that's not, you know, unfortunately that's not taught um, when you're getting your master's. It's not part of your, of your test in grad school. Like, make sure you validate others. Like, that's not something that you're, like, that you spend weeks studying that they drive home, you know? Like, it's important to get your credentials. I mean, Bobby, you're the one that's the master's level therapist. Did you have, did you have ad nauseum, you know, things that you had to read and take, take tests on, making sure that you knew the importance of validating your clients? Like, was that, like, a course in, of study no. that they <laughs> I had no course on validation. <laughs> exactly. And yet it is such an integral part of our recovery journey as survivors. So um, please know that they work for you and you can communicate your needs to them. So gosh, driving that home. So you answered Joey's question really, really, really awesome. And then um, Amanda says, thank you. And there are a few people on here saying the same thing, that they're afraid to use their voice. They're afraid to communicate their needs. I just want to validate you guys. I want to validate you and let you know that when you were a child, sometimes your basic needs for safety, clothing, food, love, acceptance, appropriate care, those needs were not met. And so to communicate your needs, especially a need for validation, as an adult can be really terrifying. And it is natural for you to have trepidation and even thinking about communicating your needs. It can be terrifying. And it's really, really helpful. We'll talk about this in the one page, but it's really helpful to find yourself a community of safe people, safe survivors that have lived through what you've lived through, some that are maybe farther along in your recover, uh, in their recovery journey than you are, so that you can express to them, like, I'm nervous about this because I've never done this. Has anyone here in this group of survivors ever asserted their needs or communicated that they needed something from from someone and how did that go and how should I approach this and how should I word it and what should I say should I write it down should I make a list and it's really good to like bounce ideas off of other survivors and just that in and of itself is a validating experience so I highly recommend that um, and Laura says, rawr, it's Laura. She says, I love you, Laura. She says something so key. Uh, she was talking back and forth with someone, and she said, it honestly amazes me that kindness and compassion are such a rarity these days, and validation is a part of that. You guys, that is the whole, that one tweet is the whole nutshell of this whole Q&A session that Bobby are here for. Kindness and compassion are a rarity in the world these days, sadly. It's a place where you can come and receive kindness and compassion. Sometimes a little kick in the booty as well. Like if we're like, hey, you got to use your voice. You got to communicate your needs. But it's still, it's a validating and safe place for you to hang out with other survivors like you. And it is so, 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 so sad. That it is that they are such a rarity these days, Bobby. What are your comments on that? There are so many other comments um, that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, well, it's interesting because as you were talking, and you were talking about you know in in graduate school, it's not like you get a class on validation and um, how important kindness and compassion is. To me, what you're talking about there is something that we really don't teach in graduate school. I mean, they teach you the facts. You know, this is how you diagnose, this is how you elicit information, but what they don't teach you and what you're saying is critical, which I personally believe is very critical, especially for trauma survivors, is the relationship element, okay? We don't need just a helping professional who knows their stuff about trauma. 
It's very important, and I don't want to dismiss that. Very important. But we need someone who's able to establish a healthy, caring, therapeutic relationship with us. Yes, someone who's kind to us, who's compassionate, someone who validates our experience. That's a relationship skill. Um, and you need someone because therapy is the place where you're going to start to practice these new skills that you're learning that you didn't get to learn when you were a child. Therapy is the place where you're going to learn how to love yourself. Therapy, coaching, you know, working with your spiritual advisor, whoever you work with, that's the place where you're going to learn how to have a healthy relationship. So if this person doesn't have good relationship skills, they're not going to be a good therapist for you. Because for trauma survivors, abuse is a relational trauma. Therefore, it has to be healed within a healthy relationship. So if you can't have a healthy relationship with your helping professional, then it's not that that those meetings are not going to do everything we need them to do. It's going to be like, you know, needing a bucket of water and going down to, you know, find that the stream trickle of water is only eh, half an inch thick. You're not going to get everything you need from that. You need a, you know, you need a stream, a waterfall, um, and you're not going to get it if all you're getting is a little tiny trickle. So, um, yeah. Look for I, what you're doing. Yeah, well, what you're describing is someone who is emotionally unavailable. Yeah, but you know, some of them say, and like I, I said before, some of them say, well, that's not my job. My job is to help you have a relationship with yourself. My job is to help you elicit the responses that you need. So they're there, they're in this tabula rasa environment. They're just a mirror reflecting back to you. They're not there to have a relationship with you. So, which is a cop out, in my opinion. <laughs> well, it's not my it's not my philosophy, and I don't think it helps. And I don't think, especially, that it helps for trauma survivors. But there, there are multiple schools of thought that believe that that's the that's the role of the therapist. Um, that doesn't work for me. Yeah, and didn't work for me in my recovery, and I don't think that'll ever work for me in any aspect of mm. my life. Yeah, but. I think I'm with you. I I think I would tend to agree with with what you said, honestly. I mean, I don't understand how that can be helpful. I, I just, anyway, I guess I need to move on because I, I there's no way I can even come to like a clear stream of thought that would even, I just don't see how, I understand that, like you said, there are multiple entities yeah. and theoretical schools you know, behind the whole process yeah yes that yeah. that is you know or and then also I, I can't even it, we will be here for three hours if I start talking I'm gonna I'm not gonna talk so I'm just gonna read the responses and questions that were given to us by our community how's that I, I just want to point out really quickly Athena that your response it's very typical for a trauma survivor who's asked to be competent in that kind of a therapeutic environment. Your response is typical for a trauma survivor who says, but, but this therapy is no good for me. It's not helpful. I feel so invalidated. I feel like you're not even emotionally available. So, you know, I, I just, I want people, everyone to see that was such a perfect example of why that kind of a therapeutic relationship is not helpful for us as survivors. So if you have been given that as a therapeutic professional and you're not feeling like you're getting what you need, then there's nothing wrong with you. Just like there's nothing wrong with Athena saying that I don't see how that even works. Um, because, <laughs> you know, she, she can't even begin to grasp how that would be helpful to someone. I, but yeah, that's I like four of a sentence. Like I'm like, no, oh, that's yeah. that's my point. Is that we yeah. go into we have been assigned this therapist who does this particular theoretical model. We go and we sit down, and they offer us that blank slate. You're back, and we're like, but I, wait, no, 
not helpful. But we're the ones who are deemed to be a bad client. Right. Time, time out. Oh. <laughs> no, don't go there. <laughs> and they're just doing their job, right? They're just doing... They're, you know, they're doing the job that they that they've that they've been called to do, and they're doing it the way that that they've been taught. But it, again, not going to be helpful for trauma survivors, likely. So it's natural, is what you and I are basically saying the same thing, and that is that it's natural if if someone watching here has ever felt like a but uh, no, <laughs> like in therapy, if you, if that's ever been you, or you walked away going. Well, that was a gigantic waste of time. Like you're not alone. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's it, and there's and that is probably one of the most powerful things that someone has ever said to me. And I want to say this to someone, and that is, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you. You are you, and you are where you're at right now because of what you've been through, and you're working through it. You've been through it, and you're working through it, and you're going to get there. You're going to get there, and it's just not, not going to be with maybe every helping professional that comes into your path. Right. So, and along those lines, I want I just want to um, share some of the comments that are being shared on the Twitter stream by our community, and that is, Matt says, when a therapist invalidates you, it can be so hard to regain that trust, even if the invalidation was unintentional. And I just want, I want to validate you, Matt, and I want to validate anyone out there who has felt invalidated by a helping professional. And you're, you, you've been invalidated by a helping professional, perhaps, like let's just pretend, not that it's ever happened to any of you, maybe it's just me, but you've been invalidated and you're contemplating not going back to that person, but you're stuck because in your mind, you're, go you're saying, I've put forth all this time. I've shared my whole story with this person. I've never told anybody in the whole world everything that's happened to me except for this one helping professional. I really thought this was going to work. I really thought this was going to help. And now I'm at this point where I'm feeling completely invalidated and like they really just don't get it. And I don't want to start over with somebody else because I'll feel so invalid. I'll feel like an invalid. <laughs> Hello, I will feel invalidated as a human being. <laughs> I will feel worthless and like my story doesn't matter and like I just have to repeat myself and then what if they don't get it and you know maybe this is the best it's ever going to get. And I just want to encourage you keep looking. Keep looking. Don't settle. Please don't settle for someone who invalidates you because they could be causing you more harm than good and they could be halting your recovery journey. They could be re-traumatizing you every week or as often as you meet with them. And re-traumatization and secondary trauma, secondary trauma, secondary trauma, over and over and over again. The likelihood of you getting past that and moving forward with that one helping professional is slim to none. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying that you incurring secondary trauma and invalidation and just being re-traumatized over and over and over again isn't the healthiest path for you, the survivor, necessarily. There is someone out there that is perfectly fit for you. And there is a helping professional out there who will validate your experience as a survivor. And they will validate you as a person and validate your feelings and your fears and your thoughts and your and your struggles and 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 really cheer you on and be your partner in your in your recovery journey and I just want to I want to encourage you to keep looking and don't just settle if you're being invalidated by a helping professional um, Angela says something super interesting Bobby she says be careful who you seek validation from many don't want you to own your truth because they live in denial how true is that Bobby yes and she's right you have to seek your validation from healthy people not from the people, and we talked about this this morning in chat, 
Um, if you're new to watching our channel, we have three Twitter chats every week. And this one that you're watching, either live or on a rebroadcast, is the second one. But the first one is Monday mornings, our time, and Monday evening in the UK. Um, and I can't even begin to remember what I was going to say. Athena, what were we talking about? Oh, 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 oh it's about, it's about um, being careful who you share your truth with because not everybody deserves, not everybody is going to validate you. I can't remember what I was going to say, but oh, somebody in well, chat this morning. Angela, Angela says, be careful who you seek validation from. Many don't want you to uh, own your truth because they live in denial. Good grief, you guys. Okay. Um, don't ask for validation for people who have a vested interest in denying your truth. And that means often family, enablers. Um, sometimes it's people you're in a relationship with who are giving you the Oh, get over it. I'm so tired of this. Why can't you just let it go? Seek validation from people who are healthy and who understand your process. Not from people who want you to kick your trauma to the curb without resolving it. So, yeah, someone who yeah. says that you should just be over it, or if someone says, gosh, you're an adult now, and that happened when you were a child, in this family, we forgive one another and we move on. And that's what you need to do. You need to forgive and move on. Okay, I'm telling you, that is not a safe, Respect. that is not a safe environment. No. Anyone who tells you what you should be doing and what you need to do and you need to do it now in their timeline, that person is not a safe person. A safe person will allow you the space necessary they will hold a safe space for you. Like I'm holding this space right here, this little space in my arms right here. I'm holding this safe space whenever you're ready to come and to heal and to share what it is that you've gone through. And I will hold this safe space for you. Or I will hold this safe space here for you. This is a safe space right here. This is a safe space. You can come, you can heal. You can, you can share what it is that you've gone through. I'll hold this safe space for you in your own time. I want you to, to heal and do all you need, that, all you need to heal in your own time. There's no rushing. You don't have to do it on my timeline. You do it on your timeline because everyone has a different timeline. That is safe. Someone saying what you should do and how you should do it and when you should do it. Lickety split, hurry up. That's not safe. Dawn would like for us to really express to everyone how horrible and horrific a, the term malingerer is and how awful it is to call someone a malingerer. What you, what you are basically calling someone, if you're calling them a malingerer, is you're calling them a liar. You're calling them a manipulator. You're, you're saying that they are pretending to be wounded and pretending to be hurt and pretending to have something wrong with them um, for their own benefit, that it's all just a big fat lie and that they're just that they're just basically faking it. And that is a horrible thing to say to anyone that has been through trauma. Um, it is just as inval it's just as invalidating and harmful as asking um, a rape survivor, well, what were you wearing? Well, why were you walking down that dark street? Well, why did you have a beer? Well, why did you go out with those friends if you didn't even know them? Well, why didn't you talk sooner? Why didn't you report it to the police? Why, you know, the whole hashtag rape culture, you know, the, the victim blaming, my computer's acting really crazy. I just want to make sure that, uh oh. Um, so it's just as bad. Anyone calling you a malingerer is just as bad, if not worse, if not worse than, than blaming someone for their own abuse and basically saying it's because of what they were wearing, it's because of the people they went out with, it's because of um, the street they were walking down. It's invalidating their entire experience and it's wrong. Well, and worse, Wouldn't you agree, Bobby? Yeah, is it that that's a label? within the mental and medical health field 
that if you get, if that label is associated with your name, it will dog you and other professionals will jump to automatic assumptions about you before they perhaps even have an initial appointment with you. Um, and it's, it's like a, you know, you have a big malinger tattoo on the front of your forehead. Um, it, that's never, 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 never a good thing. And unfortunately, as trauma survivors who sometimes have things like very treatment resistant depression, um, we don't get better on other people's timetables. And that's where the risk of that label comes in. And it's, it's awful. Then, like Athena said, it's horribly invalidating. And all it does is reinforce what we learned as a child, which is that we are bad and everything that's happened to us is our fault and we deserve it. And that is the exact opposite of what we need. So, a validation. That's the exact opposite yeah. of validation. Yeah. Uh, well, it validates lies. Um, How's that? Yeah. It doesn't it validate validates the truth. And it, it adds another layer of glue yeah. to the shame upon shame upon shame upon shame upon shame, all the shame that binds us, right? Yeah. Um, Shy Sharon, Bobby, Shy Sharon says, validation is new to me. I accepted most of my abuse recently. I'm scared of validation. It makes it real and it's real ugly. We're not telling you that validation is always like a awesome, wonderful, delicious little feeling that you just want to gobble up and just enjoy. Like it's not always like what Sharon is saying. She brings up a good point, And that is that when somebody validates what it is that's happened to you, not ready for that smack in the forehead. Like boom, it just hits you right between the eyes. And you're like, wow, wait a second here. In fact, I remember when I first joined Bobby, when I first joined Sex Abuse Chat, like uh -huh. um, Jan January of 2014, right. I remember like for the first time in my whole life, I had people, my truth, like for me, it was like they were me and they were writing these tweets and I'm like, that was me. I felt that. I did that. I that was that was me. And it was the me that I had been trying to deny for 30 something years because it was too painful to really accept and realize and I wanted to believe the fantasy. I wanted to believe that I could have healthy awesome relationships with my abusers and my enablers and all of my invalidating family members and bullies and just blech. I I wanted to believe that it was all just in my head because having my experience validated it brought the memories whoosh to the front of my mind and so validation can be triggering I want to validate anyone who is experiencing that Especially you, Shy Sharon, who mentioned it. Bobby, you um, would you like to comment on that? Because sometimes it is really like, oh my goodness, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I think validation can be triggering, not in the sense that it brings back memories of our abuse or causes flashbacks, but it triggers a truth. You know, it triggers a deep knowing of something that, for the first time we can really grab onto and say, okay, she's right, he's right. This really happened to me, it really was awful. I really need to face this now. So yeah, validation is not always warm and fuzzy, but it's typically very powerful and truthful. So sometimes we get truths that we didn't really want. Sometimes we get truths that we feel like we're not ready to face, um, but Sometimes that's the best thing in our recovery. Not always. I mean, we certainly don't want someone poking us with a stick from behind us saying, faster, faster, move in the direction I want you to move. But sometimes when we're a bit stuck, a bit of validation can get us unstuck. So. Uh, perfect. That's a great segue, Bobby. I agree wholeheartedly. And Marianne says, validation givers, people who are giving validation, they, have, they need to have some degree of healing, do you think? 
And then Dominique says, good question. I think at the very least, a degree of awareness enough to recognize abuse. What are your thoughts on that, Bobby? <laughs> Can you read it again, Athena? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm sorry. That's okay. Did I read it too? Did I read, did I read it too fast? You read it while I was reading a tweet and I didn't hear it. Oh, whoops. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to read it again to you. Okay. So Marianne says validation givers, like people who are giving validation. Yes. They need to have some degree of healing, do you think? And then Dominique says, good question. I think at least a degree of awareness, enough to recognize abuse. I I would definitely agree that, I, I don't know if I would agree that it's a prerequisite, but I would agree that the most, for instance, the most helpful helping professionals and practitioners are those who are survivors of, of the clientele that they are that they are administering care to. So I would say it's very, very helpful and it's almost like an ad, like a cherry on top, but I don't know if it has to be like a prerequisite because like my husband is learning to be very, very, very validating and he lived like the picture perfect Norman Rockwell, leave it to be for family childhood, you know? So like, I don't know if it's like a prerequisite, but it totally helps. What are your thoughts on that? I think, first of all, I think there's a spectrum of validation, okay? And all of us can provide a basic level of validation. Because a basic level of validation is I'm sitting, I'm giving you my attention, I'm listening to you. And Rar, it's Laura made a comment about how most people listen to respond, they don't listen to understand. So they're just listening to you enough to be able to put in their two cents when they want to, okay? So there are basic levels of validation. And the basic level of validation is I'm listening to hear you. I'm not listening to respond. I'm not listening to put in my two cents. I'm here, I'm listening. So they hear you, they see you, they create a safe space for you. They're compassionate, um, they're kind, they're non-judgmental, okay? That's, that's a very basic level of validation that I think anyone can provide at any time. I've had my son, who's 35 years younger than I am, provide me with validation sometimes because he'll just say something as simple as mom you look sad and I'll say yeah I am sad and he'll say it's okay you can feel sad anybody can do that but when you start getting up into more expert level validation you know you you get you need someone who says I've worked with survivors before I've seen this before and I want to let you know that it's not abnormal for you to feel this way. This is completely typical of a survivor of response to feel the way you do. So I think it just depends on how much validation you need, what you need validation for. And, you know, you've got to find someone on somewhere on that, that expert level from rookie to, you know, level 100. Um, to give you what you need. But everybody can let you know that what you feel is okay. And everybody can just sit down next to you and hold a space for you and give you compassion without judgment. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need to do that a little more often. Well, yeah, I think I agree, we do. Marianne says that this is a very validating place that she needs to heal the core of her being and very toxic very often toxic company, like very toxic people deplete her. And I just totally agree when I'm around toxic people, I get completely depleted or people who, like I sat across from someone at lunch a week or so ago who talked the whole time about how much they knew about everything. And they tried to loop in the work that I do with survivors as a, uh, sort of a, not not directly the work I do with survivors, but people's healing journey needs to just happen like quickly, like snap, snap, like check it off the list, like choose to move on. And it's a huge sign of personal growth for me personally that I wasn't triggered to the point where I had to leave because I sat through the entire lunch and I sat there very firmly in my position and I stated why it was that what he was saying was very short-sighted and that healing is different for every person. 
and not everybody works on the time on the timeline that every like not everybody's timeline is the same and depending on where someone is in their journey you need to determine when they heal and when they need to slow down a little bit you know what i mean bobby it's like yeah. to have to have i mean he literally sat there you know and and he knew everything about everything and i was just like normally like maybe a year or two ago i would have just been like I'll see you at home, like catch a ride with someone, you know, like I would have bailed, but I stayed there the whole time. And I was like, no, sorry. Like, that's just not the case. Like not everybody, there's no one size fits all no. to the recovery journey. And that's part of our one page on, on validation. You know, Bobby, Rebecca Rose says something interesting. She says, but I was created to meet needs, not have them. I'm yeah. sure she said that tongue in, tongue in cheek. Uh, survivors, we do uh, sort of, we have often subscribed to that sort of thought of, you know what, I was, I was born and created to, to meet everybody else's needs, not to have needs of my own. It's just been sort of our role yeah. that we've played. Yeah, uh, but as Bobby and I think like, that is. Yeah, right? Because we were we were meeting other people's needs from a very young age, whether it was their their perverted needs for, to sexually abuse us as children or needs to exploit us or to hold hold their power over us in order to make themselves feel better or whatever it was, you know, whatever twisted deal that was going on. Um, but Bobby and I are here to tell you that you you were not created or born to meet everybody else's needs. You have unique needs that are yours and you deserve to have your needs met. And if one of your needs is to be validated, we would love for you, we would love to help you gain the courage and, and to become assertive enough to, to actually communicate your need for validation, whether it's to a helping professional or to a spouse or to a friend or to a colleague or, or whatever. And we're so proud of the hard work you're doing in your recovery journey. Like, we're just so proud of you because you're here. And um, Angela, Angela says, Bobby, it's a process. Safe people are vital for healing validation. Oh, it's a process. Safe people are vital for healing. Validation was a stepping stone for me to process my own trauma. And that's so true. That's so perfectly put, Angela. Validation is a stepping stone. It really is. It's an integral part of our accepting what it is that's happened to us and being able to move forward and to heal all of the, the things that have happened to us. Don't you think, Bobby? Yes, it is. It is. And we talked about that last week in terms of validation being a step in the process of accepting our abuse. And then we went further and said, I mean, accepting your abuse is a vital part in the recovery process. It's really hard to uh, recover fully if you haven't accepted the reality of what happened to you. Um, which is one of those uncomfortable truths because it means you have to jump into the fire. Um, but the sooner you jump into the fire, the sooner you get to the other side. So that's, um, um, we'll get there. <laughs> Trina, Trina shares something super awesome, Bobby. And I want to, I want to, oh, I just hit my elbow. <laughs> um, oh, I want to no. give it a bit. I know. <laughs> not the funny bone. They, they call it a funny bone and I'm oh. not sure why they do. Um, but I want to share what Trina tweeted out because this will give a lot of you hope and, and it will validate some of the things that you're going through. Trina says, I told my therapist I needed validation and it changed the conversation in a good way. Wing confetti. Woo. That's amazing. Like Trina, that is like the home run of this, of the conversation, like needing validation from a therapist and communicating that need and then having the conversation change in a way that was, that is favorable. Um, not all of us, not all of us can say that. Yeah. And my hope in some of this work that we do in these videos that we do, we give you the language that you need in order to ask for what you need. You know, some of the things like I never would have known to have asked for validation from my therapist when I was knee deep in therapy because I didn't understand that word, I didn't understand that concept. You know, and one of the reasons that Athena and I show up every week is to give everyone else the education that we wished we had had. And so we truly believe if you have the names for the terms, 
if you have the steps, you know, some options in front of you that you know you can take, that your recovery is going to be smoother because you're going to be able to seek out what you want and ask for what you need. Um, and that's very powerful for survivors because, you know, all our power got taken away from us. And the last thing that we want to do is, you know, walk into some therapy setting and have someone take your power away and say, I know what you need. Here, sit down. I'll fix you. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, you're not a you're not a car, and we are not the mechanic. No, no. <laughs> um, I want to mention something, and perhaps we can tag this on another broadcast. Um, Maggie, if you're if you're watching, um, maybe do some research on this um, in a couple weeks. Um, Dominique wants us to perhaps talk about and do a Q&A on the difference between Munchausen versus trauma responses. So much worry about seeming needy. Now, spend the next three hours talking about Munchausen and Munchausen by proxy and never ever even get through like what, what the heck it is. And so I, want, I wanted to mention this so that it would be mentioned and so that Maggie, our research intern, can do some research on it and we can schedule it out um, after assertiveness and spouses and and some of the other topics that we have but um, do you agree Bobby that's yeah. kind of a that could be a rabbit that could be a rabbit hole that would be like a like it would take a while so yes. yeah <laughs> okay um, I'm trying I'm trying to find everybody's comments here um, my therapist is validating and tells me she looks forward to seeing me but I have a hard time believing that. Grace, you are not alone. Sometimes as survivors, when we hear people say something nice to us, we think that they're just saying it to be nice and they must want something from us, but that's part of our grooming. That's part of, that's part of our grooming, Grace. But you know, the good thing about that is that that's a learning skill. It so is. you can learn that. That's not one of those skills that either you have to be born with it or you're out of luck. You can learn that. Just like you unlearned it, not consciously, but you know, I think something that's important for us to realize is just the plain old bare bones um, behavior conditioning. Okay, that's it. that's what we you know everybody heard of that Pavlov's dog, how he rang the bell and taught the dog to that food was coming, so the dog would salivate, and so then every time he rang the bell, the dog would salivate whether he was getting food or not. So. We came into this earth with a need for validation, a need for approval and affection from our parents. If we reached out for it and we got slapped down, after a while, we wouldn't ask for it anymore. And what that does is that is a negative reinforcement for that behavior. It does what's called extinguishing that behavior. We've extinguished it. It doesn't exist anymore because we, we weren't getting reinforced for it in a positive way. So it's gone. Now. You can do the opposite and bring that behavior back. So you ask for what you need and your therapist gives you what you need. That's validating. You ask for what you need, the therapist gives you what you need. It's validating. And you just keep doing that until that behavior of asking for what you need feels safe. So that negative reinforcement, that extinguishing of that behavior was exactly what happened in our childhood when we wanted or need something, when we voiced an opinion and we got slapped or beaten or verbally and emotionally punched, eventually we stopped asking because we knew it was just fruitless and dangerous. But now as adults, we can do the opposite and we can be in a safe relationship with a helping professional who, when we do what we need to do, they give us positive reinforcement and they validate us. We do it again and they validate us. We do it again and we validate us. And pretty soon that behavior has been reconstructed in a healthy way. Um, that's what I mean when I say that's a learned skill. It was extinguished out of you as a child, but you can learn it again now as an adult um, with some time and some practice. So I hope mm. I explained that so it made sense. I, I believe you did. Um, I wanted to share with you, Bobby. Lizzie says that she has cerebral palsy. 
and she was abused for it. And she has come to believe that if she didn't have cerebral palsy, the abuse would not have happened. Am I just sensitive? And I want to validate you, Lizzie, that cerebral palsy is something that's very real. And your feelings are valid the way you're feeling. But I want to gently and firmly share with you that uh, the blame and the shame and the fault lies wholeheartedly and completely 100% on your abuser. It is not a physical ailment or a mental ailment or otherwise an ailment on our part that causes people to rape or abuse us. It is a character flaw on their part that causes them to rape or abuse us. And there are so many people in our community that have um, special needs and while it may have made them an easier target perhaps and they were more easily exploited it is not the fault of their of their ailment or their special need or them or anything to do with them it wasn't because i wore green on a wednesday it wasn't because i was on crutches like you know it wasn't because i you know um, those those are viewed as someone who's predatory in nature will look for as many things as possible in order to use and exploit and abuse. Bobby, your comments on that? Absolutely. You know, people will look for what they perceive to be vulnerabilities. And if they interpret your physical limitations as a vulnerability, they will sweep in and take advantage of that. Um, but like Athena, I, I so, I so want to validate your thoughts and your feelings about that, that it wasn't your fault and there's nothing wrong with you. Um, you deserved better. You should have gotten better. You should have been treated differently. And I'm not sure, Lizzie, have you been here at chat before? I'm not sure I, if this is, if, do you think so, Athena? I think Lizzie's been here once before. I okay. might be wrong, but I'm, I'm remembering, I'm remembering her mentioning that she, maybe not. Okay. Well, I don't know, but Lizzie, Lizzie, if this is back. your first time, welcome. Come, please continue to come back and please get plugged into our online safe groups. Go to our YouTube channel to the about section. It'll show you how to get plugged in. Um, and please let us know how we can best um, support you in your recovery journey and we we would love to um, we would love to help you and support you and validate everything that it is that you're going through um, I I know that having several palsy I don't know I can only imagine that having several palsy is difficult in and of itself but then to be abused on top of that and be recovering from abuse on top of that it must be very overwhelming sometimes and I just want you to have the support and the validation and the encouragement that you have always deserved and so we would love to be that for you and with you if if you would like to come back um, we're so glad you're here and Sarah your sweetheart is here I know. that means she's not sleeping I though I wish you were sleeping Sarah oh my goodness gracious um, I, I feel like I missed some other questions or comments, Bobby. Oh, I think you're okay. Um, um, do you want to move so over to the web page? Yeah, and we can I think see if any pop up while we. Um, yeah. It doesn't look right. Okay, hang on just a minute. <laughs> I'm talking to my. There we go my slides if only that was really a solution talk to the slides <laughs> um, you guys um, I'm gonna try to catch your questions if I missed something please feel free to tweet me again in case I missed it if I missed something that you want answered please tweet it out again if I missed it okay so let's go through the one page um, again these are over on our website no more shame project.com there's a tab up at the top to the right that says downloadables. Click on that and you will see um, every one page that we have done since the dawning of Trauma Recovery University. And you, they are um, available to you. You can print them all off. 
um, fold them, cut them, make them into paper airplanes, put them in a binder, whatever helps you. So I'm going to go through this and I'm going to read this because some people are listening to us only on a podcast or um, they want to get all of the information without having to read it themselves. And so sometimes we find that just kind of reading through is helpful. So the power of validation. Childhood abuse is an almost unbelievable horror for both victims and those who hear about it. Often as survivors, we struggle to accept what happened to us because it seems unbelievable that someone meant to help and protect us could betray us and hurt us. We are plagued by doubt and even second guess our experience. Struggling to fully accept the reality of our abuse is very common among survivors. When we have not yet fully accepted the reality of what happened to us, it is difficult to move forward in our recovery. One of the most powerful ways to accept what happened to us is to have our experience as a victim of abuse validated. Yet for many survivors, this is difficult to find. Most of us did not have any witness to our abuse since child abuse often happens in isolation. Our abuser and their enablers often deny the crime they committed. There is so much stigma, stigma around childhood abuse that society seems to invalidate, minimize, and deny our experience at every turn. We are often left to find our own ways to validate our childhood abuse. So here are some tips and strategies for, let's see, okay, there we go. So these are ways that you can help another survivor receive validation, okay? So when you're out there, you're interacting with a survivor, whether it's just in, you know, it's one of our support groups, it's, you know, you're having coffee with them, or if you're a helping professional working with survivors, these are some ways that you can help to validate their experience. And the first one is to educate yourself about trauma and abuse. Doing so lets you affirm a survivor's experience. And if you'll remember earlier, we talked about that, that continuum of validation, okay? Anyone can offer the, I hear you, I see you, your opinion matters, I'm creating a safe space for you. But to get up into the expert level of validation, you need to do your educating. Okay, so you need to go out there, ask questions, read, um, interact, get the information that you need in order to be an expert level validator. Do not overimpose, do not ever, sorry, do not ever impose your expectations about recovery either the timeline or the path on the survivor. Everyone's journey is different. There is no one size fits all recovery. Ask questions. If there's something you don't understand, ask. Assumptions are never a good thing in supporting a survivor. You know, and I think this one gets on that stigma. Um, you know, we are, there's that myth in mental health community that if you ask someone if they're thinking about killing themselves that that will somehow cause them to want to kill themselves yeah the same one here this doesn't apply if you have if you need a piece of information in order to help validate ask for it asking for a detail about something um nine times out of ten is not going to be traumatizing or triggering for a survivor they would probably be so happy to provide you with the information that you need about their experience so that you can validate it. Listen non-judgmentally to a survivor without dismissing, minimizing, and judging their experience. Be there. If the survivor needs to be silent and just be, allow them to do this and let them know that you are there. You know, this goes I, that wonderful phrase, you know, holding space for someone. Um, sometimes it's not about, validation is not about, you know, someone needing you to sit and listen to them as they talk. Sometimes it's just about, 
I need someone near me. I need someone to create a safe space for me. I just, I just need to be able to take a breath and know that everything is okay. So when we offer to do that, it can be just as helpful and as healing as listening and discussing. Be compassionate. When survivors feel invalidated, they can judge themselves very harshly. Let the survivor in your life know you do not think badly of them for all they have been through. Be patient. Sometimes survivors feel more validated each time they tell their story. If they need to tell their whole story to you out loud again, allow them to do this. Be kind. Accept all of the survivor's emotions, not just the ones you feel are good and acceptable. Do not react negatively or limit the survivor's expression of feelings such as anger unless they are harming themselves or someone else. Um, you know, I find that many people, not just survivors, uh, learned as children that anger was not an okay feeling to either have or express. And yet the reality is, is that anger is a very valid part of our recovery. We have a right to be angry. Do we have a right to hurt ourselves or someone else when we're angry? No but we have a right to be angry. And so we would ask that even if anger makes you feel uncomfortable, you allow the survivor to express it or you help them find someone to whom they can be safe expressing those feelings of anger. Believe. Just saying the words, I believe you, can be so very validating and loving. Many survivors have never heard those words. And if you are a survivor, these are some ways that you can find validation. You can get it from professionals. Helping professionals such as therapists, physicians, clergies, coaches, and social workers can validate our experience when they confirm our symptoms, beliefs, and emotions are consistent with what they see other survivors experience. And that's especially helpful when we know that our helping professional is they themselves a survivor. Reading, educating ourselves about trauma. When we educate ourselves about abuse and the survivor experience, we see what we are expecting is not abnormal for survivors. I can't tell you how many books I've read where I went, oh, hey, wait, that's me. They're talking about me. It's talking about me. They go, oh, phew, okay. You know, uh, I thought I was the only one. Um, other survivors. Talking with other survivors of childhood abuse lets us know we are not alone in our experience and that we often feel and think the way they do, that others feel and think the way we do. When we see the common denominator in our abuse, we feel validation. Join in safe community with other survivors. You deserve to receive validation, acceptance, support, and encouragement. When you finally receive this, you will begin to heal and recover from your trauma at an exponential rate. There is strength in numbers. Choosing to be in safe community with others who have lived your pain will help you to feel stronger and less ashamed. We have free organized virtual safe support communities where you can practice new skills and become adept at creating new healthy habits. Learn how to get plugged into free online safe support groups for survivors and click here. So if you were looking at a PDF, you could click there and that information would be there. We'll look at it in a slide here in a little bit. If you're new um, to our videos, we'll look at that. I think Athena, it's where if you, if they're watching the video right now, it's down in the um, description part. Yes. Um... What, what, um, what is down in the description part? I'm sorry. How to, that's okay. How to um, how to join one of the support groups. Oh, it's in the about section of the okay. YouTube channel. Okay. So if you are um, watching on Roku, I don't know if you can see if there's – go to the about section of our YouTube channel <laughs> if, you're, if you're on Roku or just message us, nomoreshameproject at gmail.com. But – 
Um, but if you're on YouTube, just click right on the little word that says about, right by the video that you're watching, just on about, and then you'll be able to see super easy how to get plugged into a safe group. Um, is that what you asked, Bobby? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. How to get plugged into a safe group? No, I just asked where it was um, because if someone was, you know, if they were like we are, we're watching on the video, it says click here. We can't click there. Because it's a JPEG. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Where do they see the information? Because um, it's a video, yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're watching, um, you can you can just go to you can go to the about section of the YouTube channel. Um, Sarah asked a great question. Do we have time for? Oh my gosh, we're five minutes over. Five minutes over time, guys. Where does the time go when we hang out on Monday nights? Um, Sarah asked a great question, though, Bobby. I would love to be able to ask it publicly so that everybody can get their answers. Can you ever get to a 100% validation if your abuser denies the abuse? Um, Sarah, that is such an excellent question. And I, Bobby, can I give an Absolutely. answer real quick and then hand it, and hand it over to you? Yep. Okay. So the question is, if your abuser denies your abuse, or let's say they die them or before you even remember it clearly or let's say they they deny it they die they uh, whatever other choices there possibly are other than validating and admitting and copying to and surrendering and say here put me in handcuffs yes I'm a pedophile yes I sexually abused this person which may never happen my answer is yes my answer is yes, you can get, um, I know that it says 100% validation. So I want to be delicate as I answer this, Sarah, because while our idea in our mind right now of 100% validation includes our abuser apologizing or acknowledging, I would like to suggest, <laughs> if I may, that a hundred percent validation may look different to each person just like everyone's recovery journey is different each person's recovery journey is different and each person's 100 percent is different just like that meme that meme out there that says my 100 percent looks different depending on the day <laughs> me showing up and giving 100 percent looks different depending on what day it is and it's the case when it comes to validating our abuse and i will say it because uh, because of my actual experience with this. And Bobby, uh, I've actually shared this with Bobby previously. I don't know if I've ever shared it on a broadcast before, but I've shared it with Bobby. And it's not all it's cracked up to be. I actually had my main abuser um, apologize to me and say, I wished I would have known used so that I could have gotten us out of there. I wish I would have known you were being sexually abused because I would have gotten us away and out of that house we were living in at the time and um, so-and-so's house and I even approached him and confronted him about sexually abusing you and yeah so I wish I would have known like I wish you would have said something sooner like wow like but at the same time, this person that was apologizing and saying this to me was actually one of my main abusers. They weren't ever really acknowledging that, like, they, they acknowledged that I was abused and that the abuse did happen, but they didn't acknowledge, they didn't, even though they said they were sorry that it happened and they wish they would have known, et cetera, et cetera, they changed the subject 10 seconds later to something else, like talking about, like, pizza or something. I'm like, no, 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 whoa, whoa. I've waited 40 years for this conversation. Can you back up real quick and say what it is that you said a few seconds ago about how you're sorry? And it just wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It was an apology, but there was no, it wasn't anything. It was an acknowledgement. It was a, I'm sorry, but it was, 
it was the words, but there was nothing behind the words. Um, and then it was just swept under the rug and it was as though we were like, it was never brought up. Like that's like a monumental conversation. And that's not how it went down. It just didn't. It, it, if that's a hundred percent validation, then that freaking sucks. <laughs> so a hundred percent validation that I've received in my life from everything that I've been through and all the different layers and all the different crap from all the different people that I can't even count received more than a hundred percent validation from every single one of you guys. When you stand up and you say me too, or you tell me I'm not alone, or you send me an email or you send me a tweet or you leave a comment below a video letting us know that the work we do with survivors is amazing and that you live through what we've lived through. Like to me, that's a hundred percent validation to me. That is, I know I'm reaching people with a message of hope and like, there's a purpose for what I've been through. Like it's all just not for nothing, you know? But when I got that lame ass excuse of an apology of an acknowledgement, it was not validating. It was the inner workings on paper of what it would look like, but it didn't resonate. It didn't land. It didn't land at all. It was anticlimactic. I don't even know another word. Bobby, what do you think about Sarah's question? I just, I want to say, yes, you can receive it. You can receive 100% validation if your abuser denies your abuse, because even though mine didn't deny it and they admitted it and they admitted it several times and they even apologized, it was just, it was shit. It was, it was like, it didn't even land. It didn't, it didn't even mean anything, but yet I feel fully valid. I feel like I'm fully valid because of all of you guys and because of you and because of you, Sarah and you, Bobby and, and all of you. So what's your answer, Bobby? Um, if we're talking about, the purest of pure definitions of validation. And you and your abuser were the only ones in the space when it happened. I think without them standing in front of you and saying, you're right, I did that. Um, I think it is hard to get at that 100% level. I think it takes a lot of work on our part of our recovery but, but I don't think we need 100% validation to recover. I think that we can recover without having our abuser stand in front of us and say, I did what I did. Um, and then, of course, as Athena has pointed out, it's a whole other thing for them to say, I'm sorry I did what I did. Um, and mean it. Yeah, yeah, and mean it. There you go. Like, like, really? Yeah. Wait, back up. Yeah. Um, but I do, I, I think we can go forward. I think we can heal without having 100% validation. And like Athena said, there are ways to get validation outside of from our abuser. But if you're talking about the purest form of validation, which is someone acknowledging that what happened actually happened, then no, without a witness, without your abuser saying, you're right, I did that, we cannot get 100% of the purest form of validation. But I see that as a very small, very small, just itty bitty um, amount of hindrance to our recovery. You can get so much more by working on yourself and that feeling of self-confidence and knowing I know what I know and I know it happened. And just because you're not going to admit it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Um, and also getting that support and validation that you need from friends, from support groups, from helping professionals. All of that can mean so much and can, you know, counterbalance that, you know, okay, so I didn't get 100% validation from my um, abuser, 
but I can get so much more on this side from other sources that, you know, that part that we don't have 100% in seems so small compared and insignificant. And that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Considering, considering the fact that, that like receiving all of the inner workings of what should be validating is different than feeling validated. Um, you know, like, like we sometimes you can't explain how you feel. Like you feel something and you're not sure why it is that you feel that way, but you do. Yeah. Like I feel validated, even though the apology and all of the whatever I received was just lame and ridiculous. Like that I know that I know that they know that I know that they know. And that's not what causes me to feel valid. Yes. <laughs> like I feel valid because <laughs> I feel valid for so many other reasons, you know, like, yeah. Deshaun yeah. Barry says something really, um, asked a really good question, Bobby. Deshaun Barry says, how can you validate someone when they themselves are still somewhat in denial? Is that even possible? Um, ooh, that's a tough one. Um, no, I don't think you can validate I, someone who's in denial. No, well, chances are they probably don't even want validation because they're yeah, in denial. Like, exactly. <laughs> like they don't even they don't even want it. But like it's you know what this reminds like okay, I want to say you can you can validate someone, Deshaun, but it's almost like someone who's like mean or unkind to you and they're not sorry and you say I forgive you <laughs> they don't care if you forgive them <laughs> they're just gonna be mean because <laughs> they want to <laughs> but you're like I forgive you <laughs> like I know that might not like seem like a great example, but like I remember like when my dad was still alive, he just had this way of being kind of a bully and like he would love to push my buttons and say, call me fat and call me ugly and call me dumb and call me stupid and call me clumsy and all of that. I remember looking at him one day and being like, you can just keep calling me names. I forgive you. <laughs> and he was like, he went off and pouted like it we can try to validate someone but if they're in denial about what they've been through like it won't have the same effect on like like if we've received validation from someone as a survivor we know like what a deep cleansing breath that can feel like I don't think that they will feel that if they're in denial because they're still in denial I don't think that does that make sense yep. Bobby Yep. I, time. I'm, that's okay. Do you want to say good night and I'll do my slides? Yeah, I think we should. You guys, this was probably, gosh, there's just so much going on here. I'm still 16 minutes ago. Goodness. Um, you guys, this was, this was a loaded topic and you guys are amazing. So, um, thank you for being here and your presence here validates the existence and the story and the healing of every person that's watching this video from now until the end of time, whenever this video, however long this video is on our channel. So thank you for your presence here. And Bobby and I are just grateful for you. We're honored that you're here. Thank you for letting us know you're finding the resources and that they're helpful for your recovery journey and for sharing them with others. And next week, we're going to talk about how to become more assertive, how becoming more assertive is how, what that what role that plays in our recovery journey and how assertiveness can help us recover from childhood sexual abuse or any type of child abuse. So we hope we see you here 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern um, next Monday, the 12th. And the following week after that is the topic of spouses 
and we will have a special guest and Bobby will be traveling and um, I really look forward to seeing you guys here. So for everyone who's been here the whole time, thank you for being here. We love you guys and uh, we'll see you next week. And for those of you who are new and you would like to get plugged into Safe Community, Bobby has a screen share for you. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, wrong page. It looks there great. It, is. it looks great. Okay. Ways to contact us. Um, I'll make it bigger. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, too big. There we go. Um, if you would like to connect with us via email, our email addresses are bobbylparish at gmail.com, Athena Moberg speaking at gmail.com. No more shame project at gmail.com. And I think single handedly, Athena, we might keep Gmail in business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you can connect with us on Twitter. My handle is Bobby L. Parrish. Athena is Athena Moberg, and Trauma Recovery University has its very own Twitter handle Trauma Recovery U. You can watch all of our videos on either YouTube, Roku TV, or Google Plus just by doing a simple search for Trauma Recovery University. You can connect with us on Facebook. Um, there's our Trauma Recovery University Facebook page. There's my professional page, which is Bobby Parrish Coaching and Consulting. My personal page, which is Bobby Parrish. Athena's professional page, which is Athena Moberg Speaking, and her personal page, which is Dawn Athena Moberg. And then down here, you'll see really the only link that you need to absolutely remember is bit.ly forward slash trauma recovery you, because this will take you to the videos 24 days, 24 days a week. Wow. Ah, I just made the week really long. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. <laughs> Heaven help me if we have 28 day weeks. Oh my goodness. But then I might get how... everything done that I'm supposed to, right? I was just going to say, can you imagine how much we would get done? <laughs> <laughs> we would find more stuff to add to our place. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's do the last screen share. And. Okay, so these are ways that you can join us in safe community. All of these ways are free, always will be, never will be a charge for them, and we welcome you to attend as many as you'd like, as often as you would like, or to miss them. Um, this is about what you need when you need it. So uh, we have three Twitter chats every week. The first is on Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time in the UK. Um, and the hashtag for that is CSAQT, which stands for Child Sexual Abuse Question Time. And then there is the second Twitter chat, which is, if you're with us live, the one you're listening to and participating in right now, it is an interactive video broadcast and Twitter chat. And the um, it is held every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, and Tuesdays at 2 o'clock in the morning in the UK. On Tuesday evening, is the uh, original sex abuse chat. That's the hashtag, 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 <laughs> 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, or Wednesdays at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, if you would like to join one of our support groups, they're on Facebook. They're all secret, so no one can know you're a member of them. Um, no one can even do a search on Facebook and see that they exist. So in order to join them, we ask that you follow this four-step process. And the first thing is to jump over to um, Facebook and like the Trauma Recovery University page, then send friend requests to Athena and I. Um, when one of us accepts that friend request, then one of us is gonna get to you earlier than the other. We're in two different schedules, two different time zones. Send us a message after one of us has accepted your friend request. It says, I'd like to heal in safe community or something like that. I'd like to join one of your support groups. Um, when we connect with you, we might ask you some questions. And the reason we do that is to make sure that you are not a predator. You're not someone who's unsafe to let into our groups. 
So after we've had a chance perhaps to ask you a few questions and ascertain that, we will put you in one of our groups and post an introduction so that others can come welcome you in. Um, and again, if you want to watch the videos, bit.ly forward slash trauma recovery you, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And that's it. And on Monday, I head over to England for your three Mondays on this three Mondays, two of them are actually flying. One of them will be in England. So um, Athena and some awesome people are going to help her do these next three weeks. And um, then I will be back the first of the year. Yay. Yay. So happy for you. <laughs> Yes, it's going to be it's going to be a beautiful Christmas. Yes. Yeah, it will. I'm very happy for you. You guys, um, this has been an incredible evening, a very validating evening on the topic of validation. We are so grateful that you've chosen to spend these. Um, the, it's actually been, I believe, almost a couple of hours with us. We ran long tonight. So um, the Q&A is getting it's getting more difficult by the week to handle within one hour. It went from one hour to 90 minutes and 90 minutes is like it's pushing it now. So um, rectify that. We'll figure it out somehow um, in the new year in 2017. Figure out what we're going to do. Um, but uh, this is uh, Bobby Parrish and I'm Athena Moberg and we love to bring you everything you need for healthy informed trauma recovery. So thanks for being here. Share this with someone you love who is a trauma survivor, childhood sexual abuse, or any type of child abuse. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.